Well, I, uh, of course, I distinguish between theology and spirituality. And um, when I was a young Dominican in training, I said to my uh, bosses, uh, superiors, I said, uh, my generation is going to be less interested in religion, more interested in spirituality. And there's no one here teaching spirituality as such. We do things like fasting and chanting and celibacy and all this, but there's no under understanding of it all at a deep level. So send someone on to study spirituality. Hmm. And, and I'm glad to volunteer. I think. But um, uh, now, you know, that was back in the early 60s. And now, of course, we have old generations saying, I, I want to be spiritual and not religious. And um, so I think the whole thing of spirituality is about experience and the experiential thing. And um, what drew me to um, joining the Dominicans as a, and I went to a public high school, and all my best friends were either Jewish or agnostic or atheist or something. So we, we'd have these great philosophical debates, and I'd go to my parish priest, who was a Dominican, and he'd give me good books like G.K. Chesterton or mm. Thomas Aquinas stuff. So the intellectual side of the tradition was very important to me from the start. But what really um, awoke me to it was reading Tolstoy in high school. Mm. Between my junior and mm-hmm. senior high school, I read War and Peace. Mm. And I told a friend it blew my soul wide open. Mm. So I'd had a mystical experience. I didn't know that language. Right. But I said, I want to explore what happened to me. Mm. And that's really what drew me into, into uh, the Dominicans. Mm. And, um, and, and that kind of uh, worked for me because uh, the practices and the study. I mean, the whole idea of study as a spiritual practice is so important. It's important for the scientists if they can see it that way. But in, in my tradition, but also in the Jewish tradition, you know, to study Torah with your heart, mm-hmm. not just your head, is, is a, a mitzvah, and it is a spiritual practice. Well, that's what we were taught to as Dominicans, right. that study itself is prayer. Mm-hmm. And um, uh, so that, that, that had a lot to do with my own um, interest. And, and theology as such, I, I, I wasn't that drawn to. A spiritual, I want to get back to the experience. I remember I did an interview years ago in Holland, this Dutch uh, interviewer. He is very, he's a very smart guy, young, youngest, in his late 30s. And um, when he finished the interview and the lights went down, he, said, he leaned over and said, I want to ask you a personal question. He said, is it true that you Americans actually believe you can still experience God? This is with the lights off and not TV. It really hit me. You know, it really hit me. And because, you know, that was, that's the only thing that drew me and, and kept me in, mm. in the game, you might say. So we had an interesting discussion after that. Well, it's interesting because I think, you know, I think spirituality, I mean, certainly in the um, formal study of theology, still is a second-class citizen. Mm. Uh, we have this thing that, you know, everything needs to be objective, needs to be analytical, needs to not have the subject of experience, you know, melded into it because it just confuses the data, so to speak. And I think it's really been to the... Uh, to the downside of certainly of theology as a discipline, and I think of the knowing process as a whole. We've created an educational system. You touched upon this on Friday, you know, where it's all fact basis, all information driven, and so the role of the personal subject is not part of our educational experience, and so we know a lot of stuff, but we don't know anything about ourselves, you know. And I think, you know, we we become, uh, you know, are we really? a knowing person or are we just information overloaded, you know? And I think, so the role of spirituality is, you know, uh, something that I I think does need a a renewal in terms of its importance uh, because it's saying that the subject, you know, the person plays a fundamental role in, you know, in what knowledge is about and the way knowledge shapes our world today. Uh, We can't divorce knowing the knowing from the, you know, from the personal subject. Uh, experience is an important thing. I mean, there's a lot of new books coming out today on the emotional mind, the role that the emotions play in, in knowing. Our senses are our portals to the world. You used uh, the word ecstasy when you said mm-hmm. you had that high point in your scientific work. And um, my second book was actually on that, about our experiences of ecstasy as our experiences of God. And I talk about natural ecstasies we have in nature, or we have at work, or we have in friendship, or in 
love making or art and all this, but then what I call tactical exercises that the, the traditions of the world have, have shown us how through fasting, for example, or mm -hmm. chanting, or uh, uh, certain prayers and so forth, that you also prepare your mind for a breakthrough, for a satori. And, um, and so for me, that word ecstasy, which you just used very spontaneously mm -hmm. 10 minutes ago, uh, says a whole lot. And um, it's an invitation to do it, just what you're talking about, to bring experience uh, together with analysis and, and discussion. But also, we need to put it in a cultural context always. Mm -hmm. um, because um, we're not just individuals, we're part of a milieu, including language and everything else that culture feeds us. And we have to be both critical of the culture, but also aware of how we do experience the divine, if you will, the ecstasy, that which takes us out of ourselves in, in the context of our various cultures. Yeah, so, uh, but I think all that you're talking about here, I mean, you know, the one thing that we haven't really talked about too much, you've touched upon it, is the whole uh, significance of the body. Hmm. Uh, and, and, I mean, you know, I think we have to at least, you know, kind of raise the reality that we're in with the sex abuse crisis in the church and the fact that sex and sexuality is such a taboo subject, you know, that you have to kind of put this under the rug type thing or you kind of marginalize these things as if we're disembodied you know, creatures. And so there's something about, uh, you know, in a sense, the importance of spirituality, the bodiliness of what we are in terms of our senses, our emotions, that what we call the mind includes the body, that it's, we're not disembodied minds. Uh, and yet we've created a culture that sort of doesn't know what to do with the body, you know, mm -hmm. that, um, and certainly the church hasn't really helped uh, too <laughs> no. much in that way, no. if I can just add that in. <laughs> No, the, the point you're making today about uh, Descartes and how he split all that up. He was and, a uh, mess. I mean, he was De a mess, Descartes but, you know, really a, I mean, his number one influence was St. Augustine. You know, yeah, so, I well, mean, Augustine was a mess, too. He's another story. He I is mean, another Gus story. Is a... But he was so influential, and he even identified original sin with our sexuality. So I mean, That's because that, he was that, totally you know, into it. Well, you know, he that's needed... <laughs> If, any, if anyone ever needed Freud, it was Augustine. It was. <laughs> Freud came at the wrong time. But I you know, mean, there's a wonderful poem. I read it years ago. I wish I could find the author. He's a Celtic poet, and it's called Pater Noster. It, he, it was written like around 1912 or something mm -hmm. like that. And it's a, a, a story of the history of the church as a great uh, shipping vessel, great wooden shipping vessel, going through all kinds of of typhoons and hurricanes and all this for centuries and centuries and surviving. And in the 20th century, it crashes and sinks on a rock called sex. <laughs> so um, you're onto something. And you know, it's such a scandal because we have a book in the Bible called the Song of Songs. Oh yeah. Which is entirely about the theophany is love, of lovemaking. How lovemaking is a mystical experience. Now, the church, of course, has tried to clean that up. Oh, not it's totally. not that. It's, yeah. not that. it's Jesus loving the church. It's yes. God loving Jesus. Like it's all this stuff. It. Yeah. Ask any Jew what it's about. It's their <laughs> book. It's about, I mean, one of the, one of the traditions for the practicing the Sabbath in Judaism is you read the Song of Songs and you make love. Now, I never heard that advice from any priest. You probably have. <laughs> but uh, if we're going to get into the cultural dimension of spirituality and Jesus' spirituality, we darn well better uh, learn more about his Jewish consciousness. Right. Uh, one thing being that uh, no Jew believes in original sin. Elie Weissel said, not only is original sin not in the Bible, it's alien to Jewish thinking. Well, what kind of a direction have we taken building a, an edifice on uh, in supposing the name of Jesus on something you never heard of in his entire life? It's pretty strange. Right. I, I would... I, I'm 100% I'm with you. I mean, Jesus would have said, what? You know, what are we talking about here? Yeah. Well, I love you said today he wasn't Roman Catholic. He wasn't even Christian. You know, <laughs> Jung was not a Jungian. In fact, Jung said, thank God I'm not a Jungian. Aquinas was not a Thomist. And I'm sure he would say, thank God I'm not a Thomist. How, I say, yeah. thank God Aquinas wasn't a Thomist. I don't care about Thomas. I do care about Aquinas, one of the great geniuses of our, of our civilization. But I'm sure many times Jesus has said, thank God I'm not a Christian. No, I, I, I'm sure of it. And the, the thing is, it just goes to show how much of this we have constructed 
It's a constructed story. Yes. But we have we have inherited the story as if God ordained it this way. <laughs> Not the Emperor Constantine. The, the, right. The emperor, <laughs> with the Emperor Constantine. Right. Uh, the politicization of the gospel. I mean, yeah. you know, that part. I mean, really, I think Christianity ended with Constantine. You know, it never mm. really took off, so mm. to speak. Mm. Uh, because really it became a political battle, as we know, at Nicaea. And then Constantine was all about power, uh, nothing unlike what we have today. So <laughs> not much has changed. Well, I, I wouldn't be quite so severe in our ancestors. I think they were marvelous beings, such as Hildegard and, oh, and Francis guys, yeah, and, and others, and girls, yeah. who, who did launch movements and, and really tried to get yeah, Tried real hard not, to get to the core. Let's not of let's Jesus. not forget what Hildegard went through, right? You know, in her oh, yeah. freedom, in her uh -huh. courage. Yeah. Uh, I mean, being excommunicated for actually being compassionate, right? And but just for one year. Oh, she, not She that. won the fight. <laughs> we can She deal won with the that. fight at 83. You know, she was ex she was, she was a tough broad. Let's put it. Yeah. Let's, oh, let's, absolutely. She was. She yeah. Was she was one tough cookie. Right. I mean, so, these were no dandelions. No, in history, you don't have to you know? feel sorry for Hildegard. No, no, <laughs> no at all. Yeah, we don't want to meet her on a dark alley. Quite honestly, <laughs> she was. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa, all right. <laughs> she would have been that, yes, mother. Okay, yeah, whatever you say. <laughs>